So love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And God, you are love. And so uh, we acknowledge that you do that, <laughs> whether or not we even ask for it, because you are the firm foundation. But thank you, Lord, for causing us to ask that we would come to know love and love love and be made in your image. And so love, preach the message this morning, I pray. I know you use all of our stuff, the stuff we go through, but love, you're the only one that could um, connect uh, the truth to our hearts. So we pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. It's great to uh, see you this morning. A few uh, weeks ago, you may remember that I talked about my family's trip years ago to the Magic Kingdom. And about six years ago in our series through the Revelation, I told you a story about something that happened once we got there. Uh, Susan would take the two little ones on the uh, kiddie rides like Goofy's roller coaster and then I would usually take the two older ones, John who was nine and Elizabeth who was eight, on the best rides. Uh, Elizabeth uh, begged me to, to take her with me. We went on Space Mountain and then we w went on, I remember, Alien Encounter and Elizabeth begged to go on Alien Encounter. John wasn't uh, so sure. At the entrance to Alien Encounter, I don't know if you can read this, there was this, this warning sign. Standing in line, Jonathan, I remember, he kept asking me, Daddy, am I going to be okay? Elizabeth, on the other hand, kept lecturing Jonathan on courage, something that big brothers really enjoy from their little sisters. And she just wouldn't stop. She's like, look at me, John. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. I know that we're going to be okay. I'm a big girl. I'm brave, John. You be like me. John wanted my judgment. Elizabeth didn't think she needed my judgment. She was eight, and her judgment was great. In the encounter was one of those animatronic rides, you know, uh, that isn't really a ride. You don't go anywhere. They lock you in a chair, and then they feed you a story. A man on a video screen explained that he was the chairman of Excess Industries, and that currently he was on another planet on the other side of the galaxy, but now through this amazing new excess teleportation technology, he himself would beam himself through space and time across the galaxy and materialize in this giant tube in the center of the room. Pretty cool. John and Elizabeth were doing just fine. When all at once one of the technicians yells, uh, I've locked onto another planet, another planet in our transmission path. And, and then what if it's not him? It's an alien. It's carnivorous. And then the teleportation tube is starting to break. Through the, the smoke and flashing lights, you suddenly see this huge dragon-like creature in the excess teleportation module. I look at John. He looks at me. I smile. And he's okay. I look at Elizabeth. She's not looking at me. She's looking at the alien. And then I realize, oh, crap. She bought the lie. The technician yells, people of Earth, do not worry. As long as the force field beams are on, the alien cannot fly out. Just then, of course, the power fails. The room plunges into darkness. And the guy yells, it's out. Get the alien back in the tube before it eats somebody. All at once, you feel this breath, alien breath, on the back of your neck. You hear the sound of this beast eating someone, like directly above you. You feel warm liquid dripping on your arms and your face. The chair starts shaking, and you can't get out. Just then, Elizabeth starts screaming at the top of her lungs, We have to get out of here now! I look over, and seriously, I don't think ever before had I ever seen such a picture of absolute terror. I remember thinking, oh my God. She actually thinks that she's about to get devoured by this alien. We can laugh now, but in the moment, my heart just utterly broke for her. My proud little self-confident, overachieving, impulsive daughter. If I could have, I would have reached into my chest, 
pulled my heart right out of my chest and given it to her. But I was locked in my chair. So I, I looked at her and I started screaming, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's not real. It's not. Now, Elizabeth, look at me. It's not real. But she wasn't looking at me. She wasn't listening to my words. She was trapped in a lie. Started out as a nice little dream, you know, that she was in control, but that dream had turned into a nightmare from which she could not wake up. The puffs of air coming out of the tubes in the back of her seat, now, now they were real, but the breath of the beast was a lie. The water dripping on her head was real, but the alien drool and the blood from all of his victims it was an illusion that she had constructed in her mind because she swallowed the lie. The plastic in the bottle and the tube that, that looked like a dragon, well, it, it was real, but the meaning of that plastic, which now controlled her mind, her psyche, was a lie. But make no mistake, lies can kill. And people that believe lies can kill. The scars on our Lord's hands and feet are real even if he received them in the house of his friends, trapped in a lie. Nightmares are not real. And yet they're incredibly real to the souls that are trapped within them for a time. Maybe this whole world is a nightmare. Kind of like alien encounter. Except that we're the aliens. For this world is not actually our home. And we need the word of our Father to wake us up from the illusion that it is. 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, we read this before, remember, I urge you as aliens, this is the New Revised Standard, I think, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh. You know, the flesh desires to constantly exalt itself, right? The desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. And now our text for the morning, 1 Peter 5. 5b, through the end. Be clothed, all of you. Now, we talked about this on Easter, remember? Be clothed, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humbled. Humble. Be, be humbled, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, having cast all your anxieties, all your cares on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Wake up. Wake up. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in, not your faith, it literally is the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are epitelestai, to be completed, to be perfected, to be finished by your brotherhood throughout the world. He's claiming that all of our sufferings have to not only be endured, but that every encounter with evil somehow has a purpose. Verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, and all creation is grace, and there is no grace that doesn't come from God, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish, establish you. To him be the dominion into the ages. Amen. Resist him your adversary, the devil. About 30 years ago, I prayed a kind of nutty prayer. I prayed, God, I just want you to be more real to me. So if it's your desire, I, I would even pray for people with demons if that's what you wanted. I'd grown up, grown up, in, grown up, I'd grown up in the church, uh, surrounded by religiosity, and a good dose of charismatic weirdness. So I had seen a whole lot of manufactured experiences, you know, I knew that people fake stuff, and I had had plenty of education and some experience in dealing with people with mental illness. And yet once upon a time, I had seen a demon cast out of this guy by a friend during a worship service, and when it happened, I knew that was real. I was terrified of demons. 
And to be honest, maybe even more terrified of Jesus. But in short time, the Lord answered that prayer. Not that I'm looking for this now, all right? But since that time, I've prayed with numerous folks that hear voices or see things and stuff they describe as demons. And, and I've probably, and I've prayed extensively, extensively for at least, at least four people in which an evil presence or presences have repeatedly taken control of their body for, for a period of time, ranging from a, a few moments to a few hours. And during that period of time of which they would then have no memory, something else would be speaking with their mouth, their voice, to me and I to it. One of those people uh, struggled with dissociative identity disorder such that I would talk to various parts of her at different ages, little girls, but not only parts of her. This is a wild thing. I could pray with those parts. I could talk with those parts about about Jesus, and that was just fine. And yet something else would sometimes manifest through some of those parts and react incredibly violently to the name of Jesus. So I'm just saying mental illness and demonic oppression are not simply the same thing. All four of these people called on the name of Jesus, at least at times. In three of these people, we drove out numerous demons, but in one of these people, the demon stayed, for it seemed that he was just not yet ready to forgive. And if you knew his story, you would be entirely sympathetic. Whatever the case, this much I know. Jesus is madly, furiously, relentlessly in love with each one of these friends of mine. And for each of them, I have the deepest admiration and respect. Demons are like rats that live in garbage in, in your home. When you get rid of the garbage, uh, the rats don't have any place to hide, and you can chase them out with a, a stick, and the name of Jesus is like a stick. The, the garbage is sin, but not the kind of sin that they usually talk about on TV, but the kind you read about in the Bible. It's a lack of faith in grace. We all struggle with a lack of faith in grace, but for some that have been horrifically abused or ritually cursed, well, the rats seem to have just much more garbage uh, in which to, to hide. Garbage that has often been inherited um, uh, from others and uh, the sins of others, not, not their own. In one friend, after seven years of deliverance prayer, and I'm talking hours and hours and hours and years, the devil appeared. Satan appeared. And at first I thought, no, nah, <laughs> this, can't, this can't be him. Uh, but it was him. Jesus confirmed it, it was him. And I've encountered him now more times than I can count. In, in recent years, he's manifested in another dear friend. And I'm not sure if that, honestly, if that's because of what happened to her or that he's trying to intimidate me and get me to shut up. Honestly, and this is kind of weird, I haven't met another person other than Susan and myself to whom this has happened, not just demons, but Satan. Satan is an Aramaic or Hebrew term, and devil is the Greek, uh, and that usually transliterates that, like in the, old, in the Septuagint. People will sometimes say to me, Peter, don't tell these stories. They shrink the church. <laughs> Uh, they say, Peter, people will think that you're mentally ill. And they freak us out. And I totally get that. I agree with that. I agree with much of that. And, and I'm absolutely not saying that you should try and have some of the same experiences. And so I have honestly tried to cut back. But Peter just wrote, sober up. Wake up. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So you see, if I'm, if I'm deluded, it seems that Peter and Paul and John and Luke and Jesus are also deluded. And, and it's hard to resist the devil firm in your faith if you believe that there is no such thing as the devil. And yet, in a weird way, that may be kind of true. For according to Jesus, in the devil there is no truth. 
According to Jesus, just as in a shadow, you know, you know the, the, there is no truth in, in the devil, just as in a shadow, there is no, no light. Jesus is the truth. The devil is the father of lies. Jesus is the judgment of God, who is I am that I am, which appears to make the devil the judgment of I am not. And so now, if you'll humor me for just a moment, I need to touch on the problem of evil. Because, see, evil is a problem for everyone, existentially and philosophically. If someone says there is no evil, in other words, there is no bad, there is no wrong, they've already betrayed the fact that they're wrong. Just to assert that it's right to believe that there is no wrong is to assert that it's wrong to believe that there is wrong, which is saying it's evil to believe that there's evil which is silly. If someone is an atheist who then agrees that there is evil, they will have one hell of a time defining evil as anything but the absence of the good. And then they'll have another hell of a time defining the good as anything but some sort of God. And if you're a theist like me, if someone is a theist like me who claims that God is the good, and all that God creates is good, and that God creates all that is, well, then it's really difficult to explain any evil as, as anything b but nothing. And, and now if I've lost you, it helps me to think of the problem in this way. Scripture says this, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So here's the problem. How could God make a shadow? How could light make dark when dark is the absence of light? You know, all those people that are driving uh, to Texas today and tomorrow, and you guys decide not to go, that's smart, because they're literally driving to see nothing. <laughs> that's what an eclipse is. It's the absence of something called light. It's not the presence of something, but the absence of something, which is a nothing, which we call a shadow. And yet a nothing can kill you, can't it? I mean, if you're driving, you drive into a shadow, hit something, will it kill you and kill your, you, you, the person that you hit? You can listen to a lie, which is the absence of the truth, and commit genocide. You can renounce I am that I am and find yourself trapped in the I am not. So how could the sun make a shadow? Well, it can't. But maybe the sun could make an earth. And when that sun shone upon that earth, perhaps it would cast a shadow on the far side of the earth called night. And when the moon, the faithful witness who usually reflects the light, when the moon circles, uh, circling the earth blocked the sun, it would cast a shadow on the earth and it would be called an eclipse. When Jesus bore the sin of Adam on the tree, do you remember what happened? The sky grew black, and astronomers say we witnessed an eclipse, which then revealed the glory of the light. But if God, in fact, fills all things with himself, as Scripture says, then there will be no shadows. And since light is eternal, perhaps all shadow is like an illusion in time. So anyway, this is the question. How could God make evil? Well, perhaps he can't. And I mean that in the sense of he can't by definition. But perhaps he could make you. And you could cast a shadow. Perhaps he is the good. And to make beings that would know the good and love the good, they would need to encounter the not good, that is the evil, kind of like an alien encounter. Now, I did not just solve the problem of evil. Just giving you some things to think about and acknowledging the fact that evil freaks us out. It freaks us out philosophically because it makes no sense. It is quite literally chaos, which is the apparent absence of logos. It freaks us out philosophically and it freaks us out existentially in, in our experience. I mean, 
We can't deny it, right? We watch it on the news every night. We can't deny it, and yet we want to deny it. So we tell ourselves, that's a problem that modern science, Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden can fix. But they can't. Evil is horrifying. And even more horrifying when it becomes personal. And in my experience, demons are personal. Some are smarter, some are dumber, some more powerful, some less powerful. They're honestly like ignorant, mean people without bodies. And so it makes sense to me that they're fallen angelic beings created by God that will one day be redeemed. Satan, however, in my experience, is different. Evil is, is horrifying, and even more horrifying when it becomes a personal, and maybe most horrifying when it's impersonal, but shaped like a person. <laughs> kind of like the shadow of a soul, absent the soul, or the light that's in the soul, absent of the breath of God. I know this is weird, but one night in a deliverance session as we were making the devil leave, we asked Jesus, is Satan a somebody? For Satan had told this friend of mine that he was a somebody, but she heard Jesus answer her saying, no, he's a nobody. Now, I'm sure that I don't understand that, but Jesus has also revealed that to me that I don't completely understand. But I'm thankful for the insight because, you see, I, I really don't have much sympathy for the devil. <laughs> if he's a created spirit, I'm glad that he'll be redeemed. If he's nothing but shadow, well, then I can hate the darkness by shining the light. You must not hate Republicans. And you must not hate Democrats. And you must not hate sinners and charlatans, liars and thugs, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but you must abhor what is evil, according to Paul. And I find that to be very good news. There's this great line in the book Paralandra by C.S. Lewis, when Ransom is fighting the unman, who's a picture of Satan, and C.S. Lewis writes this, what was before Ransom, what was before him, appeared no longer a creature of corrupted will, it was corruption itself, to which will was attached only as an instrument. It is perhaps difficult to understand why this filled Ransom not with horror, but with a kind of joy. The joy came from finding at last what hatred was made for. As a boy with an axe rejoices on finding a tree, so he rejoiced in the perfect congruity between his emotion and its object. So number one, talking about the evil one freaks us out. I totally agree. But number two, I want to talk about the evil one in order to fill us with hope. And number three, last of all, I want to talk about the evil one so that knowing or knowing about your adversary, you'll resist your adversary. Firm in your faith, casting your cares on him, for he cares for you. So, so number two, um, my encounters with the evil one, thinking about this, have been utterly horrifying, and yet they've filled me with this even greater hope. My encounters with the evil one have been horrifying because it's just become obvious to me that evil wants to devour every one of us like a lion would devour its prey. Evil wants to make you itself the way a man eating a fish wants to make that fish himself, his own body. But Jesus wants to make you himself the way a groom wants to make his bride his own body, and so he romances you as we spoke of on Easter. He gives you himself body broken and blood shed in order that you would freely give yourself body broken and blood shed, that you would be one body with him even as he and his father are one. You see, they are a communion of sacrificial love. So Jesus will not rape you. He will allow, if you have noticed, the world to crumble around you, but he will not rape you. In other words, he allows you to say no. 
And so it's easy to think that Jesus has no power when in reality Jesus has been given all power and all authority in heaven and upon earth. And, and time after time battling the evil one, I've, I've just seen that it's true. This is really weird, I know it, but I've seen the evil one nailed to a wall in the body of a friend with just a piece of communion bread. Time and time again, I've seen him burned with just a few drops of communion wine, and the power of our Lord is not limited to those who confess him to be Lord at the time. One of my friends had always wondered why she hadn't been murdered by a man who had tried her to a bed and thrust a knife at her heart, only to drop it at the last minute just before it pierced her skin. In a vision that she received and my wife received at the same time, Jesus revealed that he had simply stretched out his hand over her heart. The knife hit her, his hand, and the guy freaked out, and he ran away in terror, which sent her on a pilgrimage, sent her on a quest upon which she met the Lord. At first, when I saw that, when I experienced that, it just made me so angry at Jesus that he could stop the suffering, and he didn't stop the suffering much sooner because I can't even tell you all that happened to her before that moment. But, but when he revealed that before that moment and in every moment when he didn't stop the evil, he suffered the evil because he revealed that to us. In my friend and for my friend, and in this way, he transforms evil into good, both in my friend and in all creation. Well, this repeated revelation that comes from praying through all of these experiences, it's just filled me with unspeakable awe, and it's produced just spontaneous worship and given birth to a great hope in me. See, I already knew that hundreds of millions have died agonizing deaths, millions and millions in Germany, under Nazi Germany, in the Soviet Union, the killing fields of Cambodia. I already knew that. I already knew that countless millions starved, largely because people like me listen to lies and don't seem to care. I already knew that everyone suffered under the dominion of evil, and evil is just profoundly discouraging when you get a good look at it. And yet it is so profoundly encouraging to realize that something is constantly holding it back. Not governments, not laws, but the hand of my friend, Jesus. And he not only holds it back, he suffers it all. And he transforms it all. He transforms evil into good, just like he did on the cross. That tree in the middle of the garden at the edge of time and eternity, such that everything Satan intends for evil, God intends for good, and God's intentions are eternal reality. While the intentions of the evil one are a temporal illusion like the nightmare of a child as she sleeps on her father's lap. So I'm just saying that my encounters with the evil one have caused me to love God as I had never loved him before and to love my neighbor as myself. If there are seating arrangements in heaven, you know, if we get a seating chart, I genuinely want my friends who have been so afflicted by evil to be seated right next to Jesus and I'll just wave in admiration from a distance. Why? You see, I think we have no idea what the person sitting next to us is battling. But once we knowingly encounter the evil one, well, you just can't help but have compassion on your neighbor. And with the deepest conviction for your neighbor, I think you would just gladly cry, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. You see, the devil made me do it. it was a perfectly le legitimate explanation for Peter. He watched it happen to his friend Judas, right? And he realized that the evil one fed on the same desires in Judas that he knew were present in himself. In fact, you remember that Jesus once looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Which makes you think maybe we all listen to Satan far more than we would like to know or admit. At the supper, Jesus said to Peter, remember, Satan asked that he could sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that, that your faith would not fail. 
So why didn't Jesus pray for Judas like he prayed for Peter? And when he prayed for Peter, why didn't he pray that Satan would be, not be allowed to sift Peter at all? You see, Jesus seems to think that there's a purpose for evil. You know, in two places, Paul talks as if, uh, well, he says, that uh, he talks about handing people over to Satan for, quote, the destruction of the flesh. Why? So that they might be saved in the day of the Lord. And think about it, none of us would be saved if someone hadn't betrayed our Lord. And didn't we all betray our Lord? I mean, we all took the fruit. We took knowledge of the good in flesh, the good in flesh, like fruit on a tree. We took the life of Christ on a tree in a garden. Why? Because in the garden of our heart, we listened to the evil one, who is evil. So, so pay attention. Evil is not the product of humanity's sin, Adam's sin. The sin of Adam is the product of the evil, of the evil one, whom we did not know was evil, and yet now we do. Genesis 5.1, this is a literal translation. This is the book, this is chapter 5 of Genesis, so it's speaking of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God made Adam. What is the day that God made Adam? That's the sixth day. And what is the day that everything is good and it is finished? That's the seventh day. I wrote a book on this titled The History of Time and Genesis of You, and I wish everyone would read it. But for right now, trust me, the whole Bible speaks as if God is still making us in his image. And part of the construction process is an encounter with the evil one before a tree in the middle of a garden on which hangs the good and the life. The whole Bible speaks as if coming to love love in the image and likeness of love is learning to choose the good in freedom, which involves a knowledge of evil, which is gained on this journey through space and time. So evil itself is not the result of your sin. And yet your righteousness is the result of witnessing our Lord's victory over evil. The death and resurrection of, of Jesus the Christ, our Lord. So I'm saying that, that my encounters with the evil one have caused me to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And secondly, to love my neighbor as myself. And thirdly, they filled me with hope. For I've seen that God has a purpose for evil. Listen closely. The evil one has no purpose. The evil one's chaos. The evil one has no purpose. It's just black, empty, childish rage. But, but my father has a purpose for evil, and that is to create me in the image and likeness of himself, the good. And he will not fail. Love will not fail. I am has a purpose for my encounter with I am not, that which is alien to the kingdom of love, which is my home, and it's your home. His purpose is that I would thoroughly enjoy him and home and all things with him, and that takes faith. So Peter writes, be humbled that God may exalt you, casting all your cares on him who cares for you. Wake up! Your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. So how do we resist him? See, we talk about this every time we meet, actually. But Peter just told us in these words, casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. In the garden of your soul, you believe the lie of the snake that you need to care for yourself because God doesn't care for you. 
The word of God to Adam was, the day you eat of it, dying you do die. The lie of the snake was, surely dying you do not die. Satan tempts Adam and Eve, saying the fruit will make you in the image of God, and ironically, it does. In Genesis 3, God says this, Behold, the man, Ha'adam, has become as one of us in knowing good and evil, and yet dying, Adam now dies, which is not good, and he knows it. We know it. We feel it. To be dead is to be separated from the life who is Christ. Scripture claims that in reality, we're already dead. And Scripture also says that the evil one keeps us in lifelong bondage through the fear of death. So we're dead and afraid of dying. So what did God in Christ Jesus do? He became a man, and dying, he does die in each one of us. And yet rising, he lives his life to God in each one of us. He literally dies our death. That he would live his life, that we would live his life uh, in us. He's the death of death, the second death, the death of death, which is eternal life. Eternal life is an eternal communion of sacrificial love in perfect freedom, which is the good. And we now know it, for he has known us. And having known the evil, we will forever freely choose the good, who is our helper and has always cared for us. And that's called faith. The faith, the faith of Jesus given to us. Faith in him is literally the death of death, which is eternal life. So this is my point. All sin is a lack of trust that God cares for you. All fear is a lack of faith that though you die, yet shall you live. All unrighteousness is believing that God is not salvation. Yeshua, Jesus. It's the nightmare in which each and every one of us has been trapped, and it's from that nightmare that the evil one derives all his power. In my experience, it has nothing, or it could possibly, but basically, yes, it has nothing to do with Pokemon cards or Harry Potter. Or Led Zeppelin. And everything to do with a lack of faith that God wants to save you, can save you, and that he will save you. That is that he cares for you. Absolutely. One night, Susan and I have been praying with a friend through the most horrifying of memories. When Satan manifested before this friend and my wife in the most shaming and horrifying of forms, as he stood before us, hurling invectives and curses, we just kept praying and casting her cares on the Lord, her cares and her questions like, did you forsake me? Can you even bear to look at me? Does Satan have my children? And as we prayed, Satan began to shrink until he finally shrunk down to this little man standing on her coffee table, talking like Mickey Mouse, going, me, 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 me. <laughs> and at that, Jesus walked into the room, walked over to the table, picked him up, put him in the pocket of his robe, turned and smiled and said, with fear, you put flesh on the evil one. So now I'm urging you to take the evil one seriously by not taking anything he says seriously. There have been times he's spoken to me through the mouth of someone for whom we've been praying, and I honestly couldn't help but just laugh out loud at the pure, unabashed arrogance and the absurdity of his lies. And yet afterwards, I have to deal with this entirely sobering thought, and that is that I seem to listen to those lies sometimes like just all the time. And so do you. Lies like God has forgotten about you. You know that one sin? Your sin? Unforgivable. You're a piece of shit and everyone thinks so. 
So why don't you just kill yourself? And if not that, just hide. There are times, particularly after I preach, when I feel so tempted to curse myself and die that I think I would. Except I've seen and I've learned where those thoughts are coming from and that agreeing with them gives the evil one power. And that power can not just hurt me, but those around me. And so I cast my cares on the one who cares for me rather than hiding from Jesus. I'm learning to dive into the sea and swim as fast as I can to him. I don't find much comfort in religious TV or devotional books, but, but I couldn't make it without sitting naked, stripped of my ego in the presence of God, my Father, who loves me. Absolutely. You may remember that there's one story we haven't talked about in our journey through First Peter that, that happened to Peter on the sea in a storm. Peter, do you remember, he looked at Jesus and he walked on the sea in a raging storm, until he turned his gauge to the raging sea, surrendered to the nightmare, and began to sink into the abyss. And yet even then, Jesus walked over and pulled him out. Even then, Jesus descended into hell and preached to the spirits in prison, even those who disobeyed in the days of Noah, when all creation sank into the abyss. Eight-year-old Elizabeth was proud. That means that she had come to believe that she could care for herself and didn't need me to care for her. And so she didn't look at me. She swallowed the lie. And she lived an absolute nightmare. However, Jonathan looked at me. As I looked at him, in the moment, he saw his reflection in my eyes. So when I smiled at him, he knew that I cared for him and that we were being fed a lie. And Jonathan actually enjoyed the ride. Due to the great number of complaints, Disney World closed Daily Encounter in 2003. <laughs> but I found this home video online. <laughs> That's how it ended. But as you can hear in the video, it hadn't yet ended for some. Everyone was fed the same exact story about the history of excess teleportation technology, fed the very same anxieties about the possibility of what might happen if an alien adversary was on the loose, and everyone felt the same puff of air on their neck. They had them installed in every seat. Everyone felt the warm water dripping on their face as everyone listened to the same soundtrack. The sensations were all exactly the same. But some people were screaming and then weeping in terror, while others were laughing and thoroughly enjoyed the ride. You know, Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. In the Revelation, John saw that the dragon battles us with a river of, of lies. So in this world, we're all fed the same lie that we must create ourselves, we must redeem ourselves, we must justify ourselves and so save ourselves. And we all feel the pain of a body that is slowly decaying in time. We all hurt, we all fail, we all die, but maybe it's possible to enjoy the ride right now if we don't buy the story and we look into the eyes of our dad. Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world, but on Palm Sunday he said, now is the judgment of this world. So all you end time people that freak out about the 
and listen closely. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this he said to show by what kind of death he would die. He died when we took his life on a tree in a garden in an effort to make ourselves in the image of God. But even as we took his life, he gave his life, revealing the heart of the Father. Jesus, from the bosom of the Father, reveals that God cares for each and every one of us more than we could even begin to care for ourselves. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. Now is the moment in, in which you must cast your cares on him. And now is when you can know even as you are known. In Revelation 17, 8, the angel says to John, I will tell you the mystery of the beast that was and is not and is about to come from the abyss and go to destruction. You see, Satan has power from the past through accusations and shame. And he has power from the future through anxiety and fear. But he loses all power and indeed is not in the present moment where eternity touches time and wakes us from the dream that has become a nightmare. In other words, now is the point where eternity touches time. Now I look into the face of my Father. Now is the moment in which one spirit communes with another. You know, it's different when you're in the present of a person, communing with that person, and now is the only uh, moment that's actually real. Now is the moment when I can love and be loved. At the cross, God revealed his heart, and so fills every moment with the reality of his presence, making all things new and all things real. Like I said, if I could have, I would have pulled my heart out of my chest and given it to my daughter. And she would have known if she would have only looked in my eyes, but she was trapped in a lie. And so the ride ended, but for Elizabeth, it hadn't yet ended. And yet what happened next <laughs> is like an eternal treasure to me. We walked out into the sunlight, sat down on a bench, and my eight-year-old independent doesn't need a daddy-daughter. She sat on my lap, and she just wept into my neck uncontrollably for 15 minutes, and then she hugged me tighter than she's ever hugged me before. I cannot fully explain the problem of evil or why God our Father allows us to suffer like we do, but my best explanation is that hug. For in that bittersweet moment, I knew and she knew that she cared for me as I cared for her and we would always care for each other. I think that knowledge is the substance of eternal life and endless joy. And in case you think she might regret the day, that day that she went on alien encounter with me, and then never, ever go on another ride with me. Let me tell you that of all my kids, Elizabeth was always the first to beg me to take her with me on all the big rides. This is a poem that I've kept in my desk for 25 years. She wrote it for me about one year after our alien encounter. It goes like this. Dads. Dads that are always there for you. Dads that will kiss you before bed. Dads that teach you how to be brave. Dads that will be there to go on the big rides. Dads that are there when you come home from school saying, Daddy, the bully beat me up. He says, I love you, Elizabeth. Dads, if they were not here, the world would be blank. Dads. And in case you didn't have a good dad, you just need to know that your dad wrapped his heart in the flesh of a man. And on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread saying, this is my body given to you. Take it, eat it. And in the same manner after supper and having given thanks, he said, this, this is the blood of the covenant, the eternal covenant my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, 
all of you and do it in remembrance of me. And now uh, I need to say I know that I said a bunch of things that many find hard to believe. And so I want you to know, don't feel pressure that you have to believe the things that I said. But I'm begging you to believe that you have an adversary that prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I'm begging you to believe that you have that adversary so that you would resist him firm in the faith, casting all your cares on the one who has always cared and will always care for you. So this morning, as you come to the table, this is what worship is supposed to be, I want you to make an offering. All right, while we're singing, while you're sitting there, ask the Lord, what are my cares? What are my problems? And just be brutally honest. And that's what he wa- that's, that's what your dad wants. <laughs> Isn't that weird when you're a dad, you find out the thing I want is for my kids to tell me, just to tell me their problems. He wants your problems. And then when the evil one says to you, well, what about this and what about that? And what about, you say, well, that's not my problem. That's God's problem. Now, if God asks you to do something, sure, just do it, but you don't have to worry about it. You're his problem. And our dad solves all his problems. So have no fear, casting your cares on the one who cares for you. This morning, bring your cares to the table, because isn't it obvious? I mean, what is he saying here? I could not care for you more than I do. Believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. And so this is the most mind-boggling thing to me. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, but you actually do have a lion inside of you. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And sometimes I just feel so weak. And then in a moment, God unwraps that for me just a little bit. He's inside of you. So don't fear the evil one. There's only one to fear, and that's your dad, and his name is Perfect Love, and he casts out all fear. Let's end the book of 1 Peter, okay? Stay standing, all right? We only have a couple more verses here. Uh, verse, verse 12, by Silvanus, that's Silas, who traveled around with Luke, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I've written briefly to you. So people always stress about the Greek in 1 Peter, and well, he's getting help from Silas, okay? Exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Peter's saying, stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, that's Rome, who is likewise chosen since greeting, and so does Mark, my son. And now after he said all this, you know, freaky stuff, if this sermon freaked you out, listen to how he ends his letter. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And since I've been telling freaky stories, I might as well tell you one more. Uh, Not long ago, this is about a year ago, we were praying with a friend, and Satan had seized control. And I mean, it's really weird, because when you pray, you're trying to figure out, because Jesus has him beat. That becomes clear. But he hides in the garbage. So you're trying to figure out what's the garbage that we need to confess or whatever. And, and uh, she was gone, not aware. And he just wouldn't shut up. And I, and, I, and I remember I just said, in the name of Jesus, I like, I put a gag in your mouth and I command you to be silent and it just wasn't going so well. And, and Susan said to me, she said, Peter, I just heard Jesus say a kiss works better. <laughs> so I took a big drink of communion wine. I kissed her on the head and it did. <laughs> it drove away the evil one. So I'm just saying what Peter just said. Y'all just had a drink of wine, right? So feel free to greet each other with a holy kiss. In In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.